And so, yeah, let me get, let's get to our speaker. We're really glad to have him today. Uh, his name is Sean Wilsey. He earned his BS in geology from Weber State University and his MS in geology from Northern Arizona University. He spent two years employed as a professional hydrogeologist with a consulting company in Salt Lake City before beginning his career at Salt Lake Community College. He's currently a ge geology professor at the College of Southern Idaho in Twin Falls, where he has taught since 2004. Sean's the author of Geology Underfoot in Southern Idaho and co-author of Roadside Geology of Utah. 2020? Utah, or Idaho. Oh, sorry. My <laughs> <laughs> bad. Roadside Geology of Idaho. My bad. Since 2020, he has used Utah, or YouTube, I keep saying Utah. He has used YouTube videos for to convey geology education to a broad audience of over 100,000 subscribers from around the world. So help me walk in, welcome Sean Wilsey today. Well, it's exciting to be here with you guys. Um, it kind of feels full circle because I started out or learning geology here in the state, graduated from Leighton High, didn't know what I wanted to do, took classes at Weber State because college is what you were supposed to do, uh, and then wandered into that first geology class in 93, and it kind of snowballed from there. And I. It, Really feels cool coming here because a few months ago you had Dr. Adolf Yonke here, who was huge in my career and development as a geologist uh, during my time at Weber State. So I watched the little video of him, and he, he looks exactly the same. So <laughs> it hasn't changed at all. Um, this is a different type of talk than what's normally given here. There, I, I don't have research to present. There's very few outcrop photos. <laughs> um, it, it might be a bit of a, a downer, but what I'm hoping to do is learn some of the things I've, take some of the things I've learned in my tenure in the geology and education world and help all of you out. And it's great we have such a diverse audience of students and professional geologists and sort of almost retired geologists um, because I think there's lessons to be learned here that we can all apply to whatever our little avenue in geology is, no matter where we are. Um, so, I'll be focusing on, it's gonna feel like the Sean Wilsey show, and I don't want it to be that, um, but I've done some interesting things, and I think there's some cool lessons I've learned along the way. I'm still figuring some things out, but the main point we're, we're gonna explore here together is just, there's this huge appetite in the public for geology. There's a lot of people out there who want to learn and know the things that you have learned and know. And as scientists, if we're really being honest, we haven't done a great job over the years. It's better than it's ever been, but we haven't done a great job communicating well with the public. It's again, it's in a better place now than it's ever been, but I still think there's so much room to grow there. And part of it, I think, is the system that we just have in place. And I'm not nitpicking anything, but we, we, we as students, we are taught, learn these new words, read professional paper, go to a conference and communicate. Um, and those are all important skills within our discipline. But maybe we, we don't we skimp a little bit on how we should be communicating with the public and the ways that we can actually engage the public with the things that we've learned uh, through our different disciplines. So um, let's say I have a couple talking points here. So community college teaching is a little bit different than maybe some of your professors at your universities. Your university professors teach, of course, but they also probably are doing some research. They may be supervising graduate students. They have grants to write. They are juggling a lot of balls all at once. Uh, I teach at a two-year college. I have no expectations other than teach your students, serve your students, and help them out. So I have a unique position where, and I'm the only one there. Like my department, th this is the department. <laughs> department meetings are very short and efficient <laughs> because it's just me. Now I miss having colleagues and I think there's, there's pros and cons to that. Um, but the, the good thing that comes out of that is that I am the face of geology to my little corner of Idaho. In Twin Falls, Idaho, if you have a rock and you want to get it identified, it ends up coming to my door, for better or worse. So I've seen all the meteorites and <laughs> fossilized turtle shells and you name it, right? Um, so it's, it's, it, that's great. I'm not, you know, I, 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 I cherish that role and I, I take that seriously. Um, but I think there's so much more we could be doing to help educate uh, the public a little bit. So, um, so my passion for just outreach and working with the public kind of starts with this sign. This is, as you get off uh, Interstate 84 and head into Twin Falls, Idaho, between Boise and Pocatello in Southern Idaho in the Snake River Plain, this was the sign you saw at least 15 years ago. I think it's still there. They might've put a fresh coat of paint on it or something, but beneath, 
the sign, you can see the bridge there below you is about 500 feet of air. People base jump off the bridge. That is the Snake River Canyon. It is spectacular. It's not the Grand Canyon, but it's still pretty cool, especially when you've been plowing through the Snake River Plain and it's pretty flat to have this 500 foot deep canyon uh, just fall beneath your feet there. So when I went there for my interview at the college, I saw this sign and I had a little bit of time and I thought, I'm just going to stop and like check this out. So I pulled over to the little visitor center, which was like a double white trailer at the time. And I'm looking at this big chasm and I kind of went there blindly. I knew it was in the Snake River Plain, but I didn't know anything about the geology in Twin Falls. I was just trying to get a job and get my family out of the California area we were in and um, just moving on. But there was nothing there. There was no information for me or any part of the public that would explain what I was seeing. I could see there were layers in the rocks and as a geologist, I could probably discern more than the average person, but there was no information. And I'm sad to report, that's kind of still the case at this location, that this is the focal gateway that visitors come to when they come into Twin Falls, Idaho, and they look at the canyon and it's beautiful and it's scenic. And they watch the base jumpers jump off and they have questions about that. Um, but there's nothing to educate them about what's going on, how this canyon was carved, what the story of the rocks is, nothing not a zilch. Um, and so that, I think that planted a seed. And so for the first 10 years or so at the College of Southern Idaho, I was just trying to figure out classes and learn how to teach and focus on students and how does a college, uni the college system work. And that was my main focus. But eventually, um, how do I advance the slides? I think I have to click back. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, thanks. But eventually I started doing other things that I kind of had not necessarily mastered, but um, had a better sense of what I was doing teaching and I started doing other things. And so I had a little bit of time on the side and I, I've always been outdoorsy. I do a lot of whitewater rafting and rock climbing. And so I weaseled my way into being the geologist on a geology themed horse tripped through Dinosaur National Monument on the Yampa River. And it was awesome. And these people just, they're soaking it up. So they're paying a little bit more than the regular person to go on a trip with a geologist, which still kind of like is, blows my mind a little bit, but, <laughs> but it's just my appetite a little bit. So this, this was kind of the start of it. I started doing, um, some of you might be familiar with this program. It used to be called Elder Hostel. Now it's called Road Scholar, but it's mainly for people can be anyone, but generally 50 and older, people who are just interested in learning, a lot of retirees do this. And so people would come from around the country to the Snake River Plain, they stayed in a little monastery near Twin Falls, and I would swing in on a vine every day with the big van, and they would jump in the van, and we'd go out and do a geology field trip for like a week. Uh, and they just thought it was great. So I knew the appetite was there. I knew the public wanted to learn more. I just needed to figure out like what, what was the best way to, to reach as many people as possible. So um, eventually I started focusing locally on, well, what can I do in my community? Um, there's a canyon rim trail along the Snake River Canyon in Twin Falls. And you can see the whole canyon laid out before you as you jog or walk or, or hike along that. And so I worked with some companies to put up some big display signs that explain a little bit about the geologic history there. Um, and I'm really proud of that effort. Um, it was a lot of work. But I think there's better ways to do this too. I think it had a, if I could go back in time, I don't know if I would do this. I think there's some other ideas I have that might be helpful. But this was great. This was a way for me to like at least put something in our community that says, hey, here's this amazing scenery you're looking at. Here's the story a little bit. Um, so that went for a little while. And then I've always been a big fan of the uh, Mountain Press publications, the Roadside Geology Series, the Geology Underfoot Series. The Geology Underfoot Series, I've always been a big fan of, and it seems like come, they come out with a new title every year. So every year I'd be kind of be hoping that there'd be a, an Idaho one, and it would be, you know, Western Washington, or it's still good, but like not in my area. And, and so I thought, well, maybe I could write that book. And that was a scary thought, but um, one that I entertained, and so I, I looked into it, and wasn't that hard to do in terms of like just getting contracted to do it. I just send in like a little outline and like a sample of like just my writing. And they're like, yeah, you can do it. Just do it. So <laughs> it, it took a lot of years. And luckily the college gave me a sabbatical one semester. So I got to take a break from teaching and focus on that. Um, but it was fun to do. The little map up there in the right is just 23 places I picked in Southern Idaho to focus on. Now, the Geology Underfoot series is a little bit different. 
instead of just roadside geology, which is just like, you know, there's a metamorphic core complex, and hey, there's some lake bed deposits over there. This one picks a specific place and does more of a deep dive, so it really gives the reader or the visitor um, places to go. And then the idea is getting out of your car, could be like a road cut, could be a, a trailhead, could be a, a death march up a mountain, hopefully, although usually not, um, but engaging them with the landscape, asking questions. Um, and so this was just a fun, just side passion project that I did. And so super proud of it. Um, I, I used students with this one to help with the graphics. Um, so there are some outcrop photos here for you as well. So a while, but then that got published in 2017. And what's next? What am I gonna do next? Well, I finished that one up and they wanted me to write a new, the roadside book for Idaho. It had been published in 1989. It was black and white. Um, we've learned a lot of geology in the intervening 35 years or so. So they wanted me to do the whole state, the new roadside geology of Idaho for the whole state. And I said, there's no way. Idaho, if you don't know much about Idaho, 500 miles from north to south. I'm at the southern, south central little margin down here in, in southern Idaho. Um, I'm ashamed to admit, in living in Idaho 20 years, I've only been to the panhandle of Idaho twice. Um, we do not have a freeway system that connects it. It's different time zones. It's different landscapes. The geology is completely different. And I would have been way in too deep had I tried to tackle, you know, northern Idaho. So I, but I said, I'd be happy to work on it with someone else. And so I co-authored with Paul Link from Idaho State University um, and Keegan Schmidt, who's at Lewis Clark State. So he handled the Northern Idaho Panhandle stuff. Paul and I split up Southern Idaho. Paul did a little more with Central Idaho as well, the more mountainous region. Um, and that kept us busy through 2021. Uh, we used Chelsea McGrave and Feeney, who does outstanding geologic maps. It was definitely a level up over having my students do the graphics, um, although they tried really hard. Um, but that came out in 2021. And the books are great. Books are a great way to reach people, but it's still a niche, right? I mean, who's really buying a book about Southern Idaho geology? I mean, it's still, that lane is still pretty narrow, right? Um, and you got to find the book and know that it exists. And I went and did a presentation just like this all over Southern Idaho. and took it to bookstores and said, hey, you want to sell my book? Not because it makes me any money. I get like, you get like 12% royalties. It's like, don't do this as a career. <laughs> um, it's like, I think I make, it's a $24 book. I think I make a buck 80 for every copy I sell. So the royalty checks come in and I'm like, sweet, $300, I'll do something with that. But, um, <laughs> but it's a passion project and it's cool to have those books out there. Um, I was actually going to, I, this here, I only wanted me to do another one. And so they said, well, how about a geology underfoot? We have one for Southern Utah. Would you consider doing a Northern Utah? And I said, maybe, because I know the geology here a little bit, but I would want to co-author with <laughs> someone else and many of the people in the room in here. So that's that's a possibility. I even as, went as far as like I had, like the sites kind of picked out and started it a little bit and then, but I got derailed. And the thing that derailed me the most was the pandemic, um, like maybe a lot of you. So March, 2020, um, no more classes. The field trips I had planned for that spring with my students, not gonna happen. You're not gonna be with your students. You can't take them down to Ogden Canyon and show them all these cool things. You can't take them out to City of Rocks. You are doing none of those things. So we limped through the spring, but I was just restless. I'm like, this sucks. This is, I've gotta have a way. I cannot teach geology remotely this way. This is not going to work. And so I need to have a vehicle. If I can't bring the students to the field, can I bring the field trip experience to the students? And so um, this guy was hugely influential on me. Some of you probably have seen him or know him. If you don't, he teaches at Central Washington University. Um, and he was way ahead of me in terms of doing anything with the public. He had been doing lectures in Washington downtown in Ellensburg. He was doing uh, little two-minute geology videos on YouTube, um, way ahead of his time. And so I watched some of his stuff during the pandemic, and most of his stuff was lecture-based. So here he is in his backyard during the pandemic in April um, with, like, his little iPhone on a, a literally a step ladder, duct taped to the top. Um, and then when he wanted to show a video, he would put a blanket over his head 
and like show it on an iPad. I mean, it was silly stuff, but it was effective. And he was reaching a lot of people, a lot of people that were probably, you know, mentally needed that break during the pandemic. And I just watched him do all this and I thought, this is really cool. And I, I was just a viewer and I, at no point was I thinking, I'm going to do, I'm going to be Nick Zentner. Um, but then I started thinking, he just keeps doing the lectures, which is good. But what, how cool would it be if you brought like the field trip? That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to bring the field trip in. Um, and so I started doing stuff, but, and it was, this is embarrassing, but you have to start somewhere. So, um, so this is my my eleven year old son at the time, with a point and shoot camera, pushing the little record button. The I mean, don't even go looking for this one. The audio is terrible. It's it's a train wreck, right? It's not even like oriented the right way. Um, but it's it was something, and it was a start. And I put it on YouTube, which at that point had I think I had fifteen subscribers. I signed up for a youtube account in 2014 and i put a couple little like videos of me in hawaii with lapa and just but i wasn't doing anything with it It was just here's a video i didn't i didn't know what what it could be i didn't i didn't think of it as a tool or a vehicle um so i did that and that was fun uh and then two things happened in the spring one in idaho and one in utah that got me going a little bit more down this path and that was we had an earthquake so you guys had your earthquake in March, mid-March, March 18th. We had ours March 31st. So, <laughs> so here's a pandemic and here's two earthquakes in the same region. Um, and so I did just, you know, I had all these questions, you know, you're the, the sole geologist in your little community and people were like, well, what's happening? I mean, when people say like your phone blows up, that actually happened to me. Um, with the Idaho earthquake because everyone felt it and I'm the only geologist all these people know so everyone had my phone number was sending me something like did was that an earthquake and and then because of the pandemic and everyone sort of just state of mind there was a lot of people out there that were thinking like this was the end and like <laughs> so I think they needed me to say this is normal this is these are where earthquakes should happen these are the appropriate magnitudes this is exactly what's happening um, so I just turned on my webcam in my office and would just kind of walk people through the data and I actually would teach people focal mechanism solutions, the beach balls, um, the little things there to show like how the earth moved. And so I did that for the March uh, Idaho quake. My sister lives here. She's a nurse and she had all her nursing friends just freaking out about the earthquake in Utah. And so they were all panicked about the earthquake. They, they were up to their eyeballs and then some with COVID-19 because they're nurses on the front lines and so she's like would you do something to like alleviate some of that stress so then this was like in April I did just kind of like a follow-up video I'm no expert I'm not a seismologist but I understand the data and I can at least kind of talk my way through the data and explain what's happening um, you live in northern Utah there's this thing called the Wasatch Fault, and you just had an earthquake. You're going to have more probably. So, um, so this was fun, and this just all these things. It, it was a snowball, right? Like, and every time I would do something, I would hear back from people, um, and it was almost always really positive, you know. And it's one of those warm fuzzies you get when you know you're making a difference in the world, right? And that's kind of like the fuel for the fire that kind of led to eventually the whole YouTube thing, um, which. I didn't know what I was doing. So then we get to the fall of 2020. We're back in classes, but we have, I'm wearing like a mask thing, uh, like, a, like a big plexiglass thing. There's literally plexiglass dividers between all my students. It's still kind of artificial. We're feeling our way through it. I'm not judging it at all, but it was, it was not what I was used to and it was different. Um, and so that fall, I asked the college president um, if I could go down to death valley and do some more videos and my videos back then were awful because i thought because i didn't know I, there's no like manual that says here's how you make good effective field-based <laughs> videos so i thought because of everything i'd seen on youtube that you had to like be in the frame mm -hmm. so like i was using my selfie stick and like if you look at these rocks here and then at some point after doing like six or seven of those videos someone sent me a little comment that said you know, you probably could just show us the rocks and that would be fine. You don't need to have, you don't need to have your face in every frame. And so I'm like, that's a really good idea. And so I learned a lot from the viewers. It was a lot of just positive, helpful tips because I was just 
I didn't know what I was doing. And so it, you can see it's small, 140 subscribers. Not like that's the, that's not the, 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 the goal. Um, and I was ecstatic at the time of 50 people watched it. I'm like, that's awesome. Didn't know how to make thumbnails. I, these were all unscripted, unedited. I just knew enough about the geology. I just went in, I didn't have a script. I'm like, okay, just, and, but I was looking for a story. If I could find a place where I knew there was a good, compelling geologic story that I could show and tell, I thought that would be enough. And for the most part, I think that still holds true today, um, that that's sort of like the recipe. Um, so that went from that in December, rolling over into June, 2021. Now I've more than doubled to 350 subscribers. And really I'm just doing these when we're on vacation. So like Mount Rainier, I didn't go there to do that video. We were going up to see my dad who lives near Seattle. I'd never seen Mount Rainier. So we went there as a family and I'm like, hey, like you guys go get some trinkets in the visitor center. I'm gonna hike over here and do like a quick little video thing. Um, but the great thing is, you know, because YouTube is this platform that has the comments, um, you get a lot of good feedback. You also get a lot of wackos and crazy people. Um, early on, I decided this is my YouTube channel. And so if it was too crazy out there, like comment wise, I just deleted it, or removed it. Um, so like, yeah, I don't want to get, make it weird, but yeah, like just wacko stuff, pseudoscience, you could probably imagine the kind of things that we got there. So, um, but it was really fun. And so it kind of went from there. Um, so that was that year. I would say 2021 into 2022 and 2023, that's when like I started really kind of figuring things out a little bit. Um, so here we are up to 4,000 subscribers in June, 2022, but it's all organic. I'm not really like, I'm not, I don't have, I'm not, I'm not advertising. I'm just kind of putting out videos, going places. Um, this was when I had to go to, I went to NAU cause my uh, grad advisor passed away. So I came through Utah. I did some stuff here. Um, where'd Adam go? That's when I was up on the hill, up on the mountain, up above, uh, by Ben Lohman doing some of those things. Um, and then somewhere in there, I, I started coming up with some new ideas. I'm like, everyone in the community brings their rocks to me. And I, I'm fine with that role. I relish that role. But wouldn't it be great if we could educate these people just a little bit on some basic rock identification skills? Um, and so I did just a very simple geology 101 level, just rock identification thing. Like, hey, let's look at sandstone for today. And let's look at metamorphic rocks or how do we know what kind of rock it is um and i did a number another one with for minerals as well so i started coming up with some other ideas um this one just came out this idea is kind of a little bit newer um and this one just kind of came to me i was driving down to great basin national park to go do some videos this last fall i'll get to that as part of another sabbatical and i thought what if i just stopped at a road cut that i don't really know anything about turn on the camera because most of the most of the videos had been i knew how old the rocks were i looked at the geologic map and so you know show and tell i'm like what if i just stop and like figure it out and approach it the way the viewer might someone that doesn't know anything about geology so i literally stopped at a road cut on nevada highway six uh south of ely and just went at it and said well it looks like we have some layered rocks it looks like they're tilted and then i just started describing things not interpreting just making observations working across the, the road cut um and just talking my way through it and it was kind of was a big hit now they're not a big hit in terms of views if you look at the random road cut series which is what i kind of named it um they don't have tons of views but i get the comments from those people they're it's like a cult group they're like <laughs> they're hugely passionate about this like when are you going to do another random road cut and, and then everyone wants you to come to where they you need to come to pennsylvania and look at this road cut and people, people sending me pictures of their road cuts and i'm like i'll, I'll get to what i can get to but um, and now of course i'm at a point now where i'm like well i haven't done any in idaho and i'm like what is it going to look like when the guy who helped write the roadside geology book of idaho <laughs> is it not so random um but i'm th thinking like well i can still do ones in idaho and just approach it as if I, I didn't know it or something so um so this was an idea uh some other ideas that came up these are pretty recent as well um i started bringing in other people so like i just met some new people in this room today i'm like mm, like they would be cool to have like a little interview just kind of bringing the public another perspective on things the most recent one i did was a volcanologist uh, ariana soldati from north carolina state university I met her 
at the eruption site in Iceland in 2022. Like all these tourists were kind of back from the lava, just checking it out. And I'm like down there with my rock hammer and getting a sample and putting on my my long sleeve shirt and my little bandana. And then I look over and there was this lady next to me and she's got like professional gear and she's sampling the lava too. And so that's how we met. So she, she's been great. So just new ideas, right? So I'm constantly trying to figure out ways to bring things to the public. I thought the field-based videos, that was the thing to do. Um, the last thing I thought would be successful and it's turned out to be the most successful is literally sitting in my office doing a PowerPoint presentation. I did one on the Bonneville flood. That's this one down here. I did one on the Bonneville flood and all my field videos had historically been, most of them, under eight minutes. The funny story about though that is that I use a little GoPro camera and I realized early on that at about eight to nine minutes, it if you go beyond that, it creates two separate files. And because early on, I'm like, I don't want to edit. So I kept my videos under that. So I'm like, I gotta tell the story quickly because like I don't have to edit. Now I've kind of like relaxed that a little bit. Um, but but if you told me that a nearly 30 minute video sitting at my computer with PowerPoint slides and a webcam was gonna like do well, I'd been like, no, that's a bad idea. That don't do that. That sucks. Um, so you gotta try stuff, right? You have to try stuff and see what sticks and see what doesn't stick. Um, so these have been fun, just coming up with little stories or I, I'm calling them lectures, but I don't really know what, what to call them for the most part. I've since, I didn't like that Bonneville flood one. I since have replaced it with a, a better one, the one you can see there near the top. Um, so it kind of went, it kind of grew from there. You know, not that the subscriber count's important, but there you can see February, 2023, I figured out how to do a thumbnail. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? So now I'm like really, know feeling myself like okay i could put text on this thing and put a thing in there um it's always tempting to do the clickbaity stuff you know so like mega flood i knew like that would like get people in um but i try to be very true because in the early days i was like geology of you know exit 22 on this highway no one's going to look at that so you have to kind of straddle the line between being factual and informative but making it something that's appealing, something that if, if you want to attract people, if you want people to engage with geology education. So, um, so you can see where it was this last summer, only like 18,000 subscribers. I, at that point I was like, this is great. I am doing just fine. This is awesome. The college um, was really supportive, recognized what I was doing. I put in for a sabbatical this last fall and said, hey, and I was using some of these videos in my classes too. I have online classes and I was using them as a way again to bring the students to the field. I have a geology of national parks class. A lot of farm kids take that. They were like right, we're like four hours from Yellowstone. I have a lot of students who've never been to Yellowstone, never been to a national park. Um, so this is a way for me to bring that to them. So I said, hey, what if I go travel around the West for the semester, uh, sleep in the back of my truck and put together some of these videos. And so I kind of did that. There's some Utah places in here um, as well as some other locations. So that was fun. So that was more videos that I was able to do. Still, my mind was always, it's the field videos. That's, that's where it's at, right? That's where I, I felt like um, the content should be mainly. Oh my but then something happened in late October, of this past year. Um, so I've been to Iceland four times. Um, I love that place, it's awesome. I'm enamored with the landscape, the people. I love volcanoes, um, it's a pretty cool place. And so in late October, when I saw there was, you know, ground deformation and earthquakes and other things happening on the Reykjanes Peninsula, I just paid attention. So I kept watching it, you know, doing my work. And then I'm like, oh, what's going on over there? And I'm watching it. And then a week into this, I'm like, well, I'm digesting and analyzing all this data. Why not share it with people? And so click, turned the video on, started recording me at my computer, looking at scientific data, like, hey team, let's look at a graph of earthquakes, right? And guess what? Huge, huge. I never would have anticipated this. Like I thought the field videos were the thing, right? Let's look at the folded rocks out in nature. No, what people really wanna do is look at graphs of seismic data and plots and <laughs> there's an appetite for this, right? Um, so this area became, you guys probably saw some of this in the news, this became a big deal. Uh, they ended up 
evacuating this town. It's still basically evacuated um, because I had a whole flurry of earthquakes. Eventually that culminated in an eruption in December. There was another one in January, another one in February, another one in March that is still ongoing, even as we speak. In fact, yesterday morning before I drove down here, I had to do another video because I got all these texts and messages from people saying, the volcano's doing something different. Like, you should do a video. <laughs> um, so there's a little bit of that too. So um, so this dominated my life. It was, it was very fortuitous that it happened when I was on sabbatical because had I been teaching my regular classes and in my regular world, I wouldn't have had the time or bandwidth to devote to this Iceland thing. Um, but you can see, I mean, I guess that's the biggest one there, a million views. They tell me that's big. Even my teenage kids were impressed. <laughs> like dad, the nerdy geologist, like they saw that and they're like, dad, legit. <laughs> um, but I wasn't doing it for that. But, but what I realized is it was, it opened up a whole new audience, right? So before I was doing Utah, Idaho, Western US stuff, and now I'm focusing on a place in the North Atlantic that a lot of people have been to, especially in Europe. So now there's all these European people uh, that are kind of jumping onto this. Uh, around this time, I started realizing and figuring out how to do a live stream. All the young people in the room know what that is. If you're new to the term, a live stream broadcast is literally, um, in this case, it would be me on my computer again, looking at the data, but people are on in real time. And then there's like a little live chat feed that's kind of going off to the side there. And so they're making comments and stuff, but it is a really valuable tool as an outreach tool to engage the public because it's not a static video that you recorded and you uploaded and now it's there. They're participating with you in real time. I would do viewer question and answers at the end. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm not, I'm not working for the Icelandic Met Office, which is like their UGS. I'm not an expert. I'm just looking at the data and giving them, I'm explaining it to them. That's what the public really wants. They need people to communicate the hard data to them. And everyone in this room is poised to do that, right? You just have to be able to take your scientific paper, your scientific jargon, and explain it to educated people who want to understand in terms that they can understand. Doesn't mean we're dumbing it down or watering it down. You know, just you don't need to always use the fancy words for the most part. This was kind of a highlight here. I got contacted by a, um, a drone company and they said would you like to fly a drone in iceland I'm like keep talking <laughs> <laughs> and they said we have the technology with starlink that you can stay in your office in idaho remotely operate the drone fly over the eruption site and we would like you to live stream it so that our company gets notoriety so they still have this it's called nature eye so you literally can and it's not just in iceland they have one in like machu picchu places in africa you know, all sorts of places around the world. So you can like go on um, and remotely fly a drone, take pictures. It's pretty cool. Um, so that was really fun to be able to do that. When this thing was erupting, to be able to work with them, fly over the eruption site, and then just narrate on the fly what, what I'm seeing and what's happening. Oh, we have this happening over here. It looks like the lava is spilling over this way. Probably the highlight of the whole thing was here. We were flying, this is the January 14th eruption. Um, this was a big day. It was a big snowstorm in southern Idaho. It was my anniversary. The eruption started at 3.30 a.m. My phone started chattering. And so I got up, went in, and we started flying over the area. And the fissure vents were opening up pretty close to town, but not that close. But in the distance, as we're flying around, I could see this, like, plume of gas coming out, like, right near this neighborhood. I'm like, we need to fly down there. So we literally flew down there and got to basically watch this brand new fissure vent open up in real time, which was like really cool to be able to see. Um, and so people were just, you know, excited and titillated by that. It did end up, that flow ended up encroaching on those houses there and it did take out three homes before it ended, um, but it was still pretty exciting. So um, yeah, so the, so the live streams are fun. That's kind of what it looks like there with a little live chat on the side. So I've got moderators now. Didn't know how to do that early on, but they're called mods. Okay? All the young people are like, dude, we know. Um, but, and they just volunteer. So I have three people that whenever I want to do a live stream are like, yeah, I'll help you out with that. And they just sort of make sure that people stay on topic. Um, you know, there's no offensive things happening because anyone can just type whatever on the live chat and it goes in there, but they can, 
delay it so it doesn't pop up right away. And if someone says something awful, they can just delete it or whatever. So, so that's been really great. And they, when I do question and answer, they can like aggregate all the questions and send it to me in an email. It's worked out really well. So I did one yesterday, even um, in the morning before I came, drove down here. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of where it's at now. And now, dun, 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 now it's up north of 102,000 subscribers, which again, wasn't the goal. I'm not trying to be a YouTuber. Um, it's just a fun side project. It's a fun way for me to still serve my students, do my day job. So for all you young people, I still teach geology. <laughs> like I've not quit that job yet. Um, but it's a fun way to engage the public. And it's opened up a whole new avenue of different things to do. We just went to over spring break to Europe and there was a viewer that wanted to meet me in Vienna. So she like told us to, to go to this coffee house to have this classic Viennese breakfast. And, and she was just delightful. So just like meeting, just kind of networking, right? Meeting more people, expanding your horizons and such. So, so I don't know where it's going to go or what, what's going to happen with it. Um, I'll keep doing it as long as it's fun. Um, I don't want to do the Patreon thing because then you have to give something back. I want to be able to do what I want to do, right? People who want me to come do the geology of their neck of the woods, if it's not convenient or, or, or I'm not inspired by it, I'm not going to do it. And I'm going to stay in my lane, right? Like I know what I'm good at. I know what geologic topics I have expertise in. And I know there's a bunch of stuff that's outside of that, right? So I'm not going to be doing some field-based video on dinosaur excavations because that is not my strong suit. Um, but I would love to meet someone who could like, talk us through that a little bit. So, um, okay, so the, the hard-hitting lessons here, just like the things as takeaway, um, you gotta be real. Like if you come across as just being, you know, this uppity scientist, like people, they detect that right away. And um, so I think just me being a goofy, Nerd, I think that resonates with people. People are like, yeah, he seems like an okay guy. Like, I, you know, doesn't he doesn't seem to be too full of himself. I don't take myself too seriously. Um, things I don't know, I say I don't know this. And how could we figure this out? Or who could we contact? Or where could we get that? I think that's an important lesson for, for everyone. Um, you need to like sharing and learning, right? And it has to show. You have to enjoy what you're doing. Um, and it has to come across. This isn't for everyone, right? For a lot of people, you have to be, you have to put yourself out there. Um, it's, it, I'm not saying it's all unicorns and rainbows and roses. <laughs> there, there's, there's some things where, that aren't so awesome, but, but it's been more positive than anything else. Um, so you need to be able to do that. You want to be talking to people. This is maybe the worst thing we do in geology. We learn a bunch of fancy terms in college, and then we spray those onto our our, our, our friends, our family. Um, and when you do that, it comes across as elitism, right? So you can use the fancy term, but teach them what it means. Give it context, give it some meaning. Um, but if we just come in, you know, you know, what? everyone knows what the paper titles read, right? The, the late Paleocene permeability architecture of the da, da 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 We all know what those titles look like and we can read them and it makes sense to us. But that's where the, the public just like, you know, that's where I think some of the, the controversy comes in the mistrust or, or the elitism and stuff so just make sure you're talking to people and not talking down to them right just explain it to them as best you can um cutting down on the jargon i kind of mentioned that one um most things can be explained simply right this rock is a vitrophere i can explain that by saying well this rock started crystallizing has crystals like a rhyolite but then the rest of the material cooled so quickly that has a glassy matrix bond, a glassy area around those crystals, right? So it's like an obsidian rhyolite hybrid. It's in between those two. That gives it more meaning than just giving it the fancy name, right? So the jargon's good and the public likes jargon, but they need to be able to understand it. And if you just spew too much jargon at once, um, it can be overwhelming. Telling a story, provide context, give it scale. Like that's a hugely important thing. Um, when I'm looking for places to do videos, is there a story here? Like, you know, if it's just tilted sandstones, that might be a story for some of you, but like, you know, I, I feel like it needs to have something that I can convey. Um, and there, there's a story with everything. That's the great thing about this kind of YouTube geology world. I'm never gonna run out of content, right? All these YouTubers who are like, oh, I gotta come up with the next stunt and I'm a parkour guy and I gotta jump over. I actually got contacted by a parkour 
from a company in the UK and they asked me, they want to go jump over lava. <laughs> and so they're like, is that even feasible? Because people are telling us we'll die. <laughs> like, well, I think if you, you know, if, if you had the right situation where there was just a little ton of lava and you could get across it with your athleticism, I think you're fine. You know, like just going into that. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I don't know how I got sidetracked by that. But um, <laughs> yeah, so just telling the story, right? Like, so making sure that um, there's something that you're passionate about that you, there's, you feel like there's. You know, there, there's observations they can make, and then it, it has an exciting story, right? And that's kind of what I look for. And what, but as long as you're excited about it, I think that's something that would resonate with people. And then just try stuff like, you know, it's okay to fail. Like, I, there's a lot of things I did wrong early on. Those videos are still there. I guess I could delete them. Um, but I kind of like that they're there. They're kind of a reminder to me of like where this kind of came from. And probably in three or four years from now, if I'm still doing this, I'll look at the stuff I'm doing now and I'll be cringing, but thinking like, oh, like, you know, the good lessons learned, right? That's how life kind of works. So um, with that, that's it. I hope I did okay on time. So yeah, that's it. Any questions, thoughts?